are you? I don't mean what city you live in, or what you drive, or even what your job is. Who are you? And what is your true purpose? Years ago, I couldn't answer this question for myself. I felt conflicted. I felt lost. I was standing on a stage singing. I used to be a recording artist. I had a cosmetics endorsement, a sports drink endorsement. I had seemingly everything going for me, yet I struggled with a sense of emptiness, a huge void, and the worst part about it was that because things seemed to be going so well, how dare I complain and say I, I felt like I wasn't living on purpose. Finally, it hit me that the problem was I was selling, I was representing, I was living someone else's life. I was selling someone else's vision of Mina Chang. Sometimes we get so busy living, doing what we think we should, or living someone else's uh, expectations, but we don't pause to think about what kind of legacy we're leaving behind until we're facing death or a life-changing event. I've had a few of those moments, but I had a moment where I had a I had to wake up, become very clear with what I wanted my life to stand for. Was it someone else's narrative of who I could be? Or listen to that stirring in my heart that I was meant to contribute to the world in a very different way, in a way that society or even a record label could never even manufacture for me. And I'm so glad that I took that risk, that leap, to follow my calling because it's changed the trajectory of my life, but now I can wake up every morning and feel that I can live on purpose. Before I tell you a little about what I've discovered on this journey of finding my purpose, I wanna give you a glimpse of where I come from because I believe that it's our experiences and even our scars that shape what fulfills us in life. Um, and when we're looking for purpose, we really do need to look back. My parents, both my parents, grew up as orphans in a war-torn country. And I know you've all known someone, many of you here have a similar background, so I'll spare you the details, but it was very difficult to survive, but they made it. And they immigrated to the United States before I was born, thank the Lord. <laughs> but when mom and dad came over, they didn't speak a word of English, but with a true entrepreneurial spirit, they found a way and these two, these two Korean immigrants started a Korean-Italian buffet. <laughs> I think their strategy on how to save money really worked. They had all-you-can-eat pasta, but they handed out chopsticks at the door. <laughs> this restaurant was in Washington, D.C., and they did quite well. It was the quintessential story of finding opportunity and a second chance. Well, running a business in such an unconventional way and finding success they were so disheartened to see so much homelessness on the streets of our own country. If you spend some time in D.C. or here in Dallas, you'll see in D.C. there's so many pe homeless people living on the streets. And, um, I mean, we would see them sleeping on top of sewage crates, tying down trash bags to try and trap in the heat. Well, uh, my parents remembered what it felt like to be hungry and cold. So out of compassion, because they saved so much food, they started a feeding route to feed the homeless with leftover food that they had at their restaurant. And they used to take me with them. We'd wake up very early every morning, we'd pack up the food, donuts, huge vats of coffee, and we'd drive out. And while my parents would set up, my job would be to go and wake up the homeless, which I, you know, it was very important because um, my first experience with homeless was seeing them being kicked away because the city would try to clear the streets before the, the day started. So. It made me feel like I was already making a difference in that way. But what's important about this is that I got to know the homeless. We saw them every day. Many of them were children just my age. I realized even at such a young age that very little separates us other than zip code, circumstances of birth, that we are all human beings. It was during this time that my parents 
modeled to me what it means to take a leap to follow their purpose because they felt a calling to serve others. And uh, <clears throat> just as they were given a second chance, they wanted to work to give others a second chance. They eventually became commanding officers in the Salvation Army. So I grew up with this kind of humanitarian work and I was introduced to the heart of it. Because as Salvation Army um, officer families, you grow, up, you grow up within the communities. You become a part of the families that you're serving. All my friends growing up were the children of the broken families. I would eat with them, we went to school together. There was no difference between any of us. They were my friends. Me going back into this work in a way is almost selfish because it's a way to not feel so helpless anymore in the face of suffering. For all of you that are doing social work, you know that there is a powerful healing in being able to do something. And that's what compelled me to take the leap and follow my calling. And callings are fueled by your vision and our set of beliefs. I believe in a world where everyone can live safe, dignified lives, a world where we can, when we do, ease the suffering of others. I believe in a world where social conditions, where hopelessness doesn't breed extremism, terrorism, and hatred. And I want a world where everyone can fulfill their potential and then contribute fully to their communities. I know that my calling is to contribute fully to this kind of world. I know that my purpose today is to build up an organization linking the world so that others can harness their passions and their capabilities to fulfill their potential. I finally know who I am. And I'm going to live, live on purpose. And I know who you are, who we are. You're not just a group of capable people that know how to do it. You're a group of leaders that were born to do it, committed to seeing possibility, living passionately and purposefully, true leaders. I know, because in our world, it takes one to know one. And here, with SVP, you don't just start up, you speak up. We seek up and we push each other to leap up. And then it's about sharing this journey together from success to significance. Success to significance meaning we're not working just to lift ourselves up, but we're looking to lift the community up right along with us and create a lasting legacy in the process. So knowing the leadership, the caliber of leadership in this room, it's truly an honor for me to be here and to share a few of the stories, some of the lessons that I've learned from entrepreneurs that are living in some of the most desperate places. So thank you for allowing me to be here. And Scott, thank you for that generous welcome. You have inspired me the way that you've chosen to live your life, and you've helped me take this leap for, towards my calling, so thank you. As CEO of Linking the World, I have the privilege of working with some of the most bravest people who are living against unimaginable odds. Working with this organization is just the vehicle that allows me to live my passion as my purpose. But I realized that just going after your passion doesn't mean things get easier. Um, when I took on this role of CEO, I inherited quite a task because we had to go through a transformation. I know all the entrepreneurs in here can empathize how painful transformation can be. Um, but just like you do as an entrepreneur, we had to think about our value proposition. What makes us unique as an organization? And for me, what was important is, what makes us truly effective in this space? What makes us needed? And so I had to turn to my mentors at this time. And to this day, all my mentors are entrepreneurs. They teach me so much. And during this time, they taught me to not just think outside the box. They taught me, think there is no box. And because of this entrepreneurial thinking, we've been able to serve people all over the world and continue to transform the organization to what it is today. And we didn't, um, as you say, we didn't take the road less traveled. 
we literally took to the skies to apply drone technology in humanitarian aid and disaster response. This program is a life-saving program that's appropriately called HALO, and it stands for Help and Locate Operations. And I'm proud to say that we'll be the first organization to be awarded an exemption from the Section 333 by the FAA, meaning we can operate in U.S. airspace. So we've got a one-up on Amazon and Google and all those guys. <laughs> um, we've become a partner agency with the United Nations. We have in-house canine search and rescue teams. We've testified in front of hearing committees on Capitol Hill. We've done things like lecture at West Point, briefed chiefs of staff at the Pentagon, We've worked alongside our men and women in uniform, and we've responded to major disasters like the typhoon in the Philippines, the earthquake in Nepal, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. We've even been to the farthest, most remote places that people have never heard about, like Vanuatu. We did all these things, but we only did it through an entrepreneurial approach, through collaboration and strategic partnerships. We're rejecting the practice of business as usual because we know that the new model for sustainable success is business as mutual. None of this could have been possible without working alongside companies that see mutual value in creating stability and opportunity in the places we work in and in the places we're willing to go. So, um, I totally went off what I was going to say, thanks to you. <laughs> he was going to steal the script. <laughs> Let me uh, make sure I didn't. <laughs> so because we uh, use so much emerging technology in our work, we always have to remind ourselves as an organization to not lose touch with what's important, with, with what's real, with the capabilities and technologies of today. It can be too easy to do that. And. Um, I know it might sound easy coming from me, a humanitarian. People tend to think of us as, I don't know, wearing Tom's shoes, eating granola, tree hugging, orphan huggers, always touchy feely. But we must touch and feel and practice connecting more deeply. Whether we're humanitarian or an entrepreneur, our companies, our products, our services, our programs, are just what allow us to reveal who we are and who we can be together, to share these lessons learned and to build upon it. It's why I continue to work in the field today, <clears throat> working with our operations abroad and engaging with the people that we serve. The people that we work with are living on the front lines of some of the most violent uh, conflict zones, war zones, and um, I'm willing to go into these places because the people that we serve are forced to try and survive there. They also remind me of what we are fighting for in every sense. There's um, a story I wanted to share. We heard Maya sing a beautiful song, Summertime, and it reminded me of a woman that I met. Her name is Maya. But this Maya is from Burma. She and her husband lived in a predatory town where they were forced into back-breaking work. All the young boys were being sold off as child soldiers. And uh, Maya and her husband had three young daughters. And it became clear that inevitably their three girls would be taken, sold, and trafficked. But rather than just accept their fate, they took their chances, they planned, and they, one day they gathered up everything they could carry in their arms, put two of their girls on their backs, and they ran away. Soldiers from the Junta found them hiding, and they kept them captive for over a week, doing unspeakable things to Maya in front of her husband. After a week, when the soldiers moved on, they took the father with them, and to this day, we don't know what happened to him. But Maya and her three girls were left traumatized, broken, no food, no water, no father. And Maya walked for days, trying to carry her girls, starving. When I met her, she described to me how one day she and her girls had found a nest of baby mice under a rock. She described boiling the mice to try and feed to her girls, but to no avail, so she molded the little pink bodies onto a stick to try to feed her children. And she described how 
watching her daughter's face contort as she tried to swallow that any light that was left in her heart that day. A few weeks later, she watched her eldest daughter die of starvation. She eventually walked into a town where she was introduced to a missionary couple who saved her. They fed her, they fed her two girls, they took her in, they let her help in the house and eventually gave her a small salary. This missionary couple, they were bringing in books, lots of books, all kinds of books. And Maya had an idea. She knew if she could carry her daughters in the wilderness for weeks, she could definitely carry books to the next towns over and sell them. So she became an entrepreneur. She worked with these missionaries and she set up a business. And even though she was illiterate, she became known as the woman to go to for the latest stories and adventures. Her customers even taught her daughters how to read. And linking the world, we met her because we hired her to help set up the mobile library program in Myanmar. We're able to reach even more children. And she is someone that I know we are working with that lives with a purpose because she wants to make sure that other women are given more chances so that they never have to endure anything like what she had to go through. Maya wears a secret badge, one made of the cuts, the scars, and the wounds from taking chances because she is driven by purpose. Um, the people that we work with at Linking the World, as you can see, they remind us of how strong the human spirit is to survive. But I've realized that when we're working in these conflict zones, if they're surviving there, it's because they're entrepreneurial. And they've taught me a new perspective about entrepreneurship. They've taught me that it's within their, it's their humility, their gratitude, and their kind of innovation that allows them to survive. And I've seen so many similarities, but they taught me. They taught me that when we're humble, we come in to serve, and we're open to learning. And when we come from a place of gratitude, we look for possibility, and we recognize opportunity, rather than looking for handouts or having a sense of entitlement. And they taught me about innovation, Trey. Trey, that the difference between innovation, that it's just the difference between why didn't I think of that and why didn't I think like that? So I want to share with you a story that illustrates these uh, principles. It's a story. It's a story about an old man, a farmer. And this old man, every year, would plant his sweet yams with his son, Jacques Mel. It's how they survived and sustained their family. But one year, the land had grown too hard, too cold, too frozen over, and he couldn't plow the land. And his son wasn't able to help him because his son, Jacques Mel, was in jail. So not knowing what to do, the old man wrote a letter to his son in jail that read, My dear son, the land is too frozen over to plant my sweet yams. Your mother, siblings, and I will not be able to eat. I wish you had made better choices. Love, your father. The next day, the old man received a cold, curt note from his son that read, Dad, whatever you do, do not dig up that land. That's where I buried the bodies. Later that evening, 30 police showed up with shovels and axes and began to dig and dig and dig up that land. Of course, finding nothing, they apologized to the old man, gave him some money for the damage, and left. The next morning, the father received a note from his son in jail that read, Dearest father, by now your land is surely dug up. I'm sorry I did not help in the way that I should, but this was the best I could do with the resources available to me. <laughs> your loving son. Never underestimate the resources you already have to invest 
that can bring out your best, can bring out everyone's best. If you're alive, it's never too late. It doesn't matter how many wrong turns that you've taken or what your circumstances are. You can change the trajectory of your life. I and mean, we see it here with the staff, with, with one another. Um, when I looked at your website, we're, coming, we're creating a new website for our organization because we're going through a rebrand, so we're copying everything off your site, by the way. And us <laughs> Another thing I'd like to borrow is your tagline. All we see is potential. I'd love to borrow that from you because at Linking the World, all we see is potential. When we're in earthquake-stricken Haiti, all we see is potential. When we're in West Africa facing an Ebola epidemic, all we see is potential. When we're in war-torn Afghanistan where it's more dangerous to be a woman than to be a man in combat, we see potential. When people say, what is linking the world? That is what we do. We look for potential and we explore layers of possibility with the people that we serve and we make positive things happen. We just happen to be a charity. And no matter where we're working, I was speaking to you about um, entrepreneurs in developing countries and conflict zones, and here, there's so many similarities, way more similarities than there are differences. You win some, you learn some. With each risk we take, we've all been empowered to joint venture off the beaten path, to come back with war stories and scars of our own, we know our last, our best teacher is our last mistake. So we give ourselves permission to fail forward in new ways and then be brave enough to go back out into the world and scale it. This is courageous work. This is disruptive leadership, leading from the edge. I'm not saying it's easy. I know how hard it can be to lead from the edge. So I leave you now with a powerful lesson that I learned recently from my daughter. I have a 10-year-old daughter, believe it or not. Her name is Trinity, and she just turned 10 last week. And she's really one of you, because Trinity owns entrepreneurial, innovative thinking. Trinity loves My Little Pony. And uh, one day while we were reading a book, I said, Trinity, how do you spell unicorn? And she said, unicorn. U-N-Y-K-U-R-N, unicorn. And I said, no, sweetie, that's, that's incorrect. And she said, well, that may not be correct, but you asked me how I spell it. <laughs> <laughs> how do you spell your idea of entrepreneurship, innovation, and living a life full of passion and purpose. How do you do that? I know you're all creating incredible companies, products, and services here, and we need you to succeed. We need people like you to succeed, because leaders like you, we recognize that we are the primary stakeholders in our shared society. If we want real ROI, we can't keep investing money that doesn't create change. We know that real wealth isn't defined anymore by whether we can pay for it, but by whether we can pay it forward. That's real ROI, what I call return on inspiration. Together we wear the secret badge, made up of the cuts and the battle scars as proof of our commitment to living a life full of passion and purpose. Let's make a promise to each other to create a story, a story about a life that answers the question, who are we and how will we be remembered? Thank you.